and Lucia, of course. My name's Emily, and I work here at the Art Center, and I just wanted to kind of introduce the two of these ladies and um, introduce you all to the gallery and the exhibit and thank them for their work, of course, their amazing artwork and um, their time and their talents. And especially because we've had the pleasure of having, hosting one of their exhibits in the past. And in this instance, we are sharing not only the amazing artwork that they create, but also a really important piece of Hawaiian history, which they share so beautifully through the pieces that they create, too. So um, a lot of extra information is provided. There's a lot of text as well as art um, in this room. And luckily, we are going to get a little more information about the works that are presented. So thank you again for coming. We're going to have a reception afterwards um, on the porch. And we'll clear the chairs out so there's a little more room to uh, view the art as well. So um, without further ado. Thank you, Emily, so You much. are so welcome. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Pakahea. A little commemorative to the ancestors. Na ao makua mai kalahi akalaka. Mai hoku akahalai. A maulo haku. Eleni kapu. Eleni Ama hoku. That's all of our ancestors, everyone inclusive from sunrise to sunset, from zenith to the horizon, forever. I welcome everyone here. I'm impressed that I have this crowd, this lovely crowd. Usually, as I said before, I said sometimes I'm always afraid that I'm going to be the only one in the room. <laughs> no matter how many times I've done this, I always have this. No one's going to come. But I'm so glad that you all did. Um, the theme of this show, Connecting the Dots, is because sometimes we take the popular culture as the culture, and we take the esoteric culture for granted. So when you hear a story, Sometimes you don't know what the foundation of that story is, so you go along with the fable, the myth, the fairy tale, and then that becomes entrenched. So you don't know what the foundation of the culture is, basically. So when you see the, the, the overall theme are the yellow, are the yellow print, print out. That's the theme of the show. It defines one very significant event in history. The red dots are to define the art piece itself. And it's up to you then to connect it to whatever other thing that there is in the room. I was going to have ribbons. But then I thought, oh my God, we'd have the ribbons for the <laughs> and that would be chaotic. So we did away with the ribbons. Uh, so the theme of the show is connecting the dots. It was originally going to be called The Last Truth because it deals with something that happened in 1819 that changed the course of history for the Hawaiians forever. And they find themselves in the dilemma that is present today because of what happened in 1819 and not what happened in 1893. So we are so taken by this sovereignty 1893 mishap. And it was a mishap, granted, but we forget that something happened before to cause that mishap. So that's what 1819 is about. The death of Kamehameha took place in 1819. After the death of Kamehameha, his, uh, one of his consorts took it upon herself because it was her family actually set him in place. 
she took it upon herself, she and her cousins and the brother, to not follow protocol. An historical protocol was that when Anali'i Nui dies, all of the land goes back into the kitty. And it is protocol, it is called Kalaina. So that all goes back into the kitty, and then when the new Ali comes forward, then it is redistributed, the responsibility, not the land itself, because no one owned land. The responsibility of caring for the land then went to his, the new regime, so to speak. Well, Kamehameha dies, and the young siblings of the four generals, they said, well, no, wait a minute. We don't want to put the land back into the kid because we fought for it. It was because of us that all of this came about, all of that we own all of this now, own earth. So what can they do then to eliminate a protocol that was about 2,000 years old in the islands, give or take a couple hundred years? So that's what happened with 1819. The fall of the couple had nothing to do with eating, had nothing to do with bananas, or women eating this or not being able to eat that. Women were not part of our Western understanding of women in their proper place. Women had their proper place in Hawaii, but they were queens of that proper place. Men had, the Loina Kane had their Hale Mua. The women, the Loina Vahine, had their Hale Aina. And never the train should meet unless they made an, an appointment and said, okay, we'll meet you at a certain, certain time at a certain, certain place. They each had their own protocol. They each had their own rules. They each had their own way of living. They each had their own food that they ate. And this went on all during the history of the Maui people, throughout Polynesia, not just Hawaii. This is a rule that is true of everyone in Polynesia. It's not a discrimination against women. As we were led to believe when I came in 1967, I was told all kinds of things, you know. Haumanu was the first suffragette, and she's the one that freed the women to do this and that, like that, baloney. That's not true. She did it purposely so that their family could benefit from everything that was won under Kamehameha. So up comes Kekuo Kalani. Kekuo Kalani and Liholiho. Liholiho was the heir of the kingdom, the chiefdom. Kehu Kalani was the kahuna nui of all of the heo and of the protocol that took place on the heo. He was the keeper of the sacred law, Lihi Kalani. So now they're going to do this. They're going to dismantle the chiefdom. They're going to dismantle their own government. Well, what's going to happen to his responsibility. He has to forego it. So he was totally against it. He said, Kamehameha gave me this responsibility. How could I just then let it go? So there was a, a fracture, a break. This was the breakaway government now. They wanted to do away with Kekul Kalani. Kekul Kalani took himself away, but they weren't happy with it. They said, you know, as long as we have this troublemaker in our midst, we're not going to be, we're not going to get what we want to get. It's not going to work for us. So this is why we have today the Battle of Kuomo. Who's ever been to Kuomo? Raise hands. Been to Kuomo? Who's from here? Who lives here in the island? All of you. You should all go see Kuomo. 
because Cromwell is the most, for me, the most sacred place on this island mm -hmm. because of what went on there and what it stands for and stood for. I went to Nevada when I came in 67 a lot because history has changed. The perception of Hawaiian history has changed so much since then. People like Heiko Kalani, Kaiana, and others like those too were not spoken about favorably. Kayana was a traitor, and so was Heiko Kalani because he did not follow what, what was demanded of him by Ahomano Kalani Moku, have I have a new. The way he was considered going against them. So therefore, he was not favorably looked upon. So the history at that time was very popular and written from the Kamehameha perspective because in the end, with this manipulation fostered by Ka'ahumanu, who wound up with everything? Bishop Estate. If you read the history, you see how that land then trickled down and how she manipulated even to the point of manipulating the relationships and marriages between her family. And not only manipulating the marriages, but manipulating on who got it if you had more than one child. Until they finally all wound up with Ruth. Ruth then gives it to Paul Ahi. And you know, the history is written from then on. And that's what was told from the beginning of time that I can remember. It's like, and then you know, well, Irina Waki Kokalani was like, well, I, I like this guy. Why do I like this guy? Why do I like Kayana? I never went for the popular theory of them being uh, traitors. That's what they were called, traitors. So I said, well, let me research and find out for myself if they were indeed traitors. And then when you read the other side and you read all of the details, you realize, well, he wasn't a traitor. He was actually fighting for what he, not only he believed in, but what his people had believed in for hundreds and hundreds of years. That was their protocol. That was their belief system. And they were going to throw it away because this faction wanted it all for themselves because they fought for it. Now, these words are written. I'm not making them up. This history is written. And you're not going to find it in one book. Believe me, you're going to find it in dozens and dozens and dozens of books. But then you finally come to the consensus and realize, oh, wait a minute, the great wrong has been done here. Because now look at the problem they have. Look what happened in 1893. Do you think that if in 18, if 1819 didn't happen, do you think we would have 1893? I don't think so. Why did Kamehameha never give up his mana? Because he knew. I'm not going to give up control of my place and what gives us power, what gives the Maoli power. What gives the Maoli power is their philosophy, not the trinkets that they create. Not this, but what this stands for. That's what gives the Maoli power. Anybody can create the trick, as, as we well know. You don't have to be Hawaiian to do Hawaiian art. And you don't have to be Caucasian to do Caucasian art. Anybody can pick up what fancies them. So, in an exhibit like this, what is important to us is what stands behind it, what stands under it. standing firmly on the shoulders of our ancestors. And don't think that applies to Hawaiians alone. It applies to all of us. I am 100% Sicilian. I'm not Hawaiian. 
And I'm not Hawaiian at heart, either. When I was really young, that everyone tried to give me a Hawaiian name. Oh, you're so Hawaiian at heart. If you dare do this, the Kalani, whatever. You're Kukuyola. You're this and that, and whatever have you. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm just Lucia, Rosalia, Taralio. That's my name. That's what I was born with. The fact that I studied this culture is because I made a Hawaiian child. So I had to know what is she about? Because I am a firm believer of inheriting and being part and parcel of all of those who came before. We can't, now with the DNA thing going on, we all know this, don't we? We are part and parcel of all who came before, and not just the blue eyes and the dark hair or the blonde hair, but now they're finding traits that we inherit from our ancestors as well. Not only physical traits, but emotional traits. So this is what the Hawaiians always knew. They believed this was part of their belief system. Akua doesn't mean God, you know, Akua, capital A, equals God with a capital G. It does not mean that. Akua is all of those who come from the back. All of those who come before me were celebrated. So when I started with the Nao Makua, my Kalahihiakala Akau, my Kaho Kuhiokarai, that's Akua. Those ancestors that gave of their energy to create this place. So getting back to Kuomo'o, the Battle of Kuomo'o, they tried desperately to persuade Ke Kuokalani to change his ways and to agree with them. He was adamant. He refused. So he said, why don't you just let me stay on my own? He went to Ka'awaloa. Let me stay on my own. I'll stay out of your way. You stay out of mine and we'll be fine. But they knew that no, because he was popular with Kapoe, with the people, that they were going to have a problem. So they said, well, no, we cannot do that. So let's go down to Kabbalah and let's try to persuade him again. Well, a fracas ensued, and he finally had a talk with his, his mate, Manono, and said, what do you think? We will return with them, but I'm not, to be, I'm not going to give up my place, my belief. So they set a trap. You come by way of, of uh, the, you follow us by way of the ocean. So they said, no, we're going to take the overland trail. So they took the overland trail. They went by way of the ocean to Kona. And they get stuck at Kuomo'o, on the outside walls of Leke Leke. The first skirmish took place and the day went to Kekotalani. The second skirmish took place and the day would go to Kekotalani. In the back I have one yellow sheet that tells you it's taken from the diary of um, Marin. Don Paul Marin. And he has day by day what transpired between Hawaii and Oahu. And you can see already that they were starting to arm themselves. Guns, gunpowder, cannons. Kalani Boku and them would go to Oahu with their ships and bring back all of this stuff. And you're wondering, well, if they're negotiating during this time, why are they doing this? Was my thought. Not that anyone else brought it up, but to me it was like, this is during the time, this is November and December. The battle took place December the 30th. So already they're already planning to have a battle 
not at Kuomo, but to have a battle where they would need guns and, and ammunition and cannons. So that second day was that. It was a disaster. So they left then. They tried to run away. And if you go, Natalie's photos are perfect. This is the ridge. We wondered, why the hell would they pitch a battle there? Because that is the most unfriendliest uh, plot of land. Uh, my, uh, my son went there with his dad, and they wore rubber slippers. By the time they got to the cairns in the back, the rubber slippers were like gone, and they could barely walk back. It is a very rough, rough place, so you wonder why would you choose to fight there? Well, they didn't choose to fight there. They were running away. They wanted to get beyond to the next valley. But there they got stuck, and there 400 people died. I think only one escaped, hid under one of the outcroppings. Kalani Moku gave the message that no one was supposed to be taken off the battlefield. They were going to be left to the carrying. They were going to be left to be plucked by the birds and whatever, and to rot. But it is known that during the night, they came and took the bodies of Manono and Kekokalani, and perhaps others too, because there were a lot of great chiefs that died in that battle as well, besides all of the kahuna that went along with Kekokalani. So we know that his bones were taken and they were um, uh, ceremonially, ceremonially, they have a, a wonderful ceremony that, uh, that they, they do that where they, they bake the body in a shallow oven, in a shallow emu, and they remove all of the flesh. And the flesh is disposed of, and they enter the bone. And the bones are usually wrapped. So what they did is they took those bones and they kept them until Pohukaina was built on the palace grounds in Honolulu, and that's where the bones of Kwekua, Kalani, and Manono are buried in that. In that, there's a, a wrought iron fence around it in that mound. I don't know what's under there, and I actually don't know if they did any study of what's under there. Mm -hmm. Did all were all the bodies removed? I have no idea, and there's no word about that. There could be because much of this has been uh, refurbished, uh, the walls uh, put up again, um, and they also fixed that sign, that god awful sign in the front that just about killed me. No, oh, it's still awful. Yeah, well, it's still. I mean, they made some concessions. Yeah. Remember, he's Kamehameha Estates, Bishop Estates. So, you know, the history is written by the victor, as we all know, not only this history, but every other history in the world. And it's only now that we can go back and do some investigation for ourselves and say, well, okay, uh, did it really go that way? Did Washington really have wooden teeth? Well, now we know he didn't. It was just the structure on the bottom, but the teeth were from slaves. So, see, when you do these kinds of researches, you find the truth of what actually happened, what actually took place. Uh, we usually don't do shows that are specifically on one theme alone. This was the first time that we did this. This was, a, 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 we do a show that is a gem, and the gem has many facets. And we do a show that is like that mostly, so each artist brings their facet into that overall gem. So Natalie and I thought, because this was like one facet of another exhibit that we had done, we thought this was in incredibly important to know on this island specifically, because this took place here. This is part of this history. This is part of these, the, the host culture from this island. There are so many fallacies that go on about this, this story. Uh, Kamehameha School gave a play a couple of years ago about Kuomo'o ke Kukalani Manono Ka'ahumani. I, I didn't go because already my, my dad was up and it's like I read, the, I read the, 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 the script and I was like appalled. First place to treat it so lightly. This isn't something you treat lightly because it changed the course of history. 
How do you treat it lightly? Secondly, introducing things that, that, that are fallacies. There's a little thing going on between Kyopulani and Te'okumono where they're singing this song about the banana and they, they're going to eat the banana because they wouldn't be allowed to eat the banana. And it's like, what? There are 70-something varieties of bananas that grew on these islands. They couldn't eat one because it was dedicated to Kumiya Kea. So do you think they were at a loss? Do you think that they really craved eating bananas if they could eat the other 75? <laughs> no. It's silly. So many silly things are introduced and they stay there. They stay there. They stay there. They're being printed in brochures. Teachers are teaching them in school. We taught at Kianala Ana for three years. You can't believe what came out of the mouths of those kids. What? Obviously the teacher isn't doing her job. Or they're just reading that one curriculum and just not bothering you going for itself. I've got hundreds of books in my house. Hundreds and hundreds. And I've given hundreds and hundreds away. You have to know. If you are here because you love this place and you're not Hawaiian, you have to know about this place. No matter where you go in the world. Puerto Rico, Cuba, Greece. Don't you want to learn about the place that you all of a sudden are in love with? It always amazed me that we are in this magnificent place filled with mana. People from all over the world live here now. And so few of them know what the hell went on here. They're just satisfied in living here because it's beautiful and the weather is lovely. And it's beautiful and the weather is lovely. They don't rub shoulders with the local people. They forget local people. They don't rub shoulders with the Hawaiians. When we started Hale Noa, Hale Noa is an art consortium that we started in 1976. And I made a differentiation between local, Hawaiian, and Haole. And we had all three in our show. We had many shows. I've mounted over 200 exhibits over the last 40 years. Travel to the mainland, travel to Europe. The difference is that the host culture is invested when the going gets tough. They often bag. Sorry, this is our experience. Not everyone, not everyone, but a lot do, because they're not invested. This is just a beautiful place to live. How many people do you think are interested in that history? What took place at the moment? All of those people dying for a belief. Not carrying signs, not shouting and screaming for a week, and then forgetting about it but they actually put their life on the line at Kuomo. Every time we go there, we're a mess. How many times we've been there, we go there and we're crying and crying and crying and crying and crying and crying and crying. Because it's like going to the Arizona. Have you ever been to the Arizona? Mm -hmm. It's like that. You feel all of those souls. You just feel them. I'm so overwhelmed when I go there and it's like, oh my God. 